Hi, my name is Jane and I'm the inventor and CEO here at Subaru. Um, Subaru is a new material that comes in little silver packs like this. Um, it's a new silicone material for repairing and modifying things. Um, so if I just cut open the pack, it comes out like Play-Doh, very much like Play-Doh or modelling clay that you played with when you were a kid. Um, and it comes in lots of bright colours. Um, but overnight, this Play-Doh-like material will turn into a really tough and durable silicone rubber. So, like for example, here on this laptop um, charger, these often break. Um, so, for example, with this one, you can see like the cable has become frayed. So, this laptop charger now, which is really expensive and very takes a whole lot of sort of energy and resources to make, not to speak of design and all the rest. Um, and what are you supposed to do? Like you're supposed to throw that out. Um, well, instead you can repair it with Subaru and you can use a bright colour to show it off as well. Um, so Subaru started as an idea that I had when I was studying design at the Royal College of Art in London 2003-2004. Um, and the idea basically was, why are designers and manufacturers the only ones that are coming up with ideas for new stuff? Um, because actually, you know, if we think about how computer games are being evolved and how architecture is, the users and the people that own the stuff actually are able to modify them and personalise them and repair and maintain things. But we don't do this yet with our stuff, like our shoes and microwaves and our TVs or remote controls or cars. All these things are like made and then we have to kind of like accept them as they are. Um, so the idea basically was what if it was really easy and really fun to modify things and repair them and um, well what could be easier and more intuitive than clay? That's something that everyone plays with when they're a kid. So I dreamt of um, a material that would be as easy to use and as intuitive as, as clay or play-doh but um, have all these fantastic physical properties and um, that would bring lots of benefits. So for example, it would need to be um, very durable, you know, it would need to be um, something that you could rely on to fix something um, and to be okay out in the weather and to be okay if you wanted to put it in the dishwasher. Um, it would need to have attractive sort of qualities. So um, I actually find the I, I love the material of silicone. You know, it has it has it has really tactile sort of quality. It sort of makes things safer. It's very heat proof. You can um, anyway. There's loads of kind of magical things about silicones. So that's what I zoned in on. And um, when I um, started to investigate in the industry whether any technology existed to to be able to sell this sort of material, I found out that it didn't exist. Um, so when I came out of um, art college, I teamed up with um, my business partner, Roger, who has worked in materials and uh, materials engineering and business for most of his life, and with two top scientists who came out of um, the R&D team in Dow Corning, which is one of the most respected um, groups in the silicon industry. So I was able to kind of pull in really great specialist um, expertise um, and the kind of side around IP and patenting is quite important with materials to make a, a business that is um, attractive to investors so that you can actually carry out all the science and stuff. So um, we went down that road as well and did uh, file some patents. Um, but the, the actual development process for this material, you know, I would say we approach the business from you know, it's very unusual for a small company or a small networked team to create a material. These materials normally come out of um, you know, large corporations um, and I think that's for a good reason. It's because they take a lot of money and, um, and time to develop. And uh, so, I mean, I learned um, how to be a lab technician and I spent two or three years carrying out formulation work under the direction of um, Steve and Ian, who were out of Dyke Warning. Um, and um, we did develop uh, the material. We almost had a working chemistry, I would say, probably three or four years later. So it was quite a slog. Um, but at that stage, it was sort of, we were just getting into the recession. So it was sort of 2008 um, time where um, we almost had a working product, but we'd run out of money. 
I guess four or five years later we were quite down and um, I was unsure whether there was a future in the project but um, a friend said to me at that time um, start small and make it good which I think is the best advice that I ever had because it totally made me rethink um, what we were doing with the business. So I had started with this big grand vision. I was like, I want to make this a household brand. I want to make everyone be excited to repair again and um, build up this culture of, of, of repairing in a really sort of mainstream sense. And so I was thinking big from the start. And I think her sort of saying that to me meant that I really sort of scaled back my thinking and thought, actually, you know what, if we get 100 people using this um, and it's working, then, you know, we can grow from there. So that's what we did. And um, just when I changed like that, we were able to ra raise enough money just to build a brand, build a website and um, make our first thousand packs, which we made in our lab. That was really where um, that ever, the whole change happened because instead of thinking thinking big, we really thought about people like us. So we 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 um, focused on bloggers and um, people like us on Twitter and Facebook and stuff, and we just got excited about um, our vision again, you know. And uh, yeah, it worked. We sold our first thousand packs in something like six hours, and you know people were really excited about it. Um, so that's. Uh, two years ago now, over two years ago, and it's grown really as a sort of an online community, um, which is extremely rewarding because it's all about people that use Subaru, you know, no matter what they use it for, whether it's gadgets or, you know, hiking boots, so here somebody's used it to patch up a hiking boot, that's the kind of thing, you know, that, you know, it varies from hiking boots to gadgets to dishwashers, to fridges, to cars, um, and people will send their pictures of what they've done, but even more so they'll tell us stories, um, and I think that's the, the real heart of what we're doing, is about like, you know, a hiking boot is something that's so complex to make, and then you wear it in, and you spend 10 years, you know, forming it to your feet, and it's been up, um, I don't know, Ben Nevis with you or whatever, like, you know, it holds all those memories and, you know, you don't just want to get a new one, new pair, so um, people do love telling those stories of what their stuff means to them. Um, I think people feel really natural to modify things and hack things and um, fix them and patch them up and that feels like, it feels really good. Um, probably because we always have done that, you know, for how many thousands of years you know we haven't had a consumer sort of society telling us like oh you need new stuff and whatever we've always sort of made do and and um and made things better and made things for ourselves um, and just in the last few generations we've lost that and um, so i think like for example i grew up on a farm and that's just how you know that's just how it is on the farm if like a gate is too small you make it bigger if it's too big you cut it down it's the same with um you know clothes you know it, it used to be that you would adapt them and you know you like take pull up a hem pull down a hem you know it wasn't like oh i must go to get a top that i'm gonna wear just this, this one saturday night or whatever um so yeah, I mean, I think the, the other thing about repairing is that it actually feels really good. Like, if you, anyone that has ever repaired something will tell you, like, you actually get such a thrill out of it. Like, there's something, um, and that, I think that's why people send us photos of what they've done, because once you've done a good, re like, a repair, and you've fixed a problem yourself, you're kind of like, yeah, I did it. And, um, yeah, it's just very satisfying. Um, so the way Subaru has grown um, over the last two years has really been through um, a word of mouth thing on online, um, which is fueled by basically people being proud of the stuff that they've done with Subaru. So if they've um, repaired, um, like for example, we'll get somebody recently repaired their motorbike and um, they're on a tour from France to Wales and they repair their motorbike on the way and they sent us a story like that. 
Um, but we get, I mean, there's thousands of stories like that online, and they all um, tend to have their own sort of interest group around the, around the, the thing. So, like, say, somebody that's interested in motorbikes, um, that will be, it'll develop a little following um, by itself. Or we have a lot of people who are considering themselves, I guess, like um, electronics makers and hobby engineers that use Subaru to make like little robots or to um, modify some of their electronics and gadgets and stuff and they'll develop their own little following as well. And I think what's amazing about um, the opportunity in online communities now is that you know people can A get to kind of show off and inspire other people and there's an amazing atmosphere that comes out of that because there's a there's something that actually is a bit of an online phenomenon, which I think is around enthusiasm. Um, you know, there's so many communi communities of enthusiasts online, which you, you would probably find difficult to find um, in a real world, you know, with all the geographical constraints. Um, and that is infectious. So, like, where somebody is really enthusiastic about something they've made, they attract people to it and then inspire other people to do something similar. Um, and then the other part of it is around learning. So, um, and and I guess the sense of purpose that comes with fixing. So, if you really believe in fixing, which a lot of our community do, like fixing isn't just like a practical solution to them. It's actually a way of life. It says something about who they are. And you know, together as a community, we are working to make a positive change. That you know, we we want to change the way people. Um, interact with the stuff and like how much they consider the value of it you know something like this isn't disposable and um, and um, so people in our community will also want to share for that reason because they want other people to think like them and I think that's amazing because it actually does work you know you'll find that um, everyone like most people in the world I guess don't even know that repairing is an option it's been sort of conditioned out of them um, they, they, they might think like their jeans are, are repairable or like a piece of wooden furniture or something but they don't think like plastics or like the inside of their car or you know a washing basin or a washing machine or they don't think they can do that um, themselves so their first instinct will be like oh you know if something breaks they'll just go oh no like I have to get a new one um, but the great thing about word of mouth is that generally, if somebody if something does break, people usually ask um, either like the guy in their family or the girl in their family that is the fixer, um, and they'll get advice from them, you know, if something is repairable, or else they'll look on Google or like um, they'll type in how to how to repair or whatever once they've known that repair is possible. Um, and I guess the other one is around retail, so um, we haven't really explored this yet, but I do think that we can build a community that involves retailers and people um, in stores that can become advocates for fixing and stuff as well. Um, that's, that's still slightly un unexplored, um, but um, we do have some retailers who are completely passionate and, you know, like people that own small stores, for example, and really want to encourage people to, to repair. So I think community builds around anything that somebody can be passionate about. And, um, yeah, we're very excited about how, how that's forming around the Subaru. As a product, it's very exciting to see a community form around it. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the future, we, um, our vision for Subaru is very big, um, I guess naively big. We want Subaru to be something that it is in everyone's toolbox um, or kitchen drawer or whatever so that they can solve problems um, with it whenever the problems crop up. Um, so, yeah, it is a really sort of... Um, big vision and I guess it's global as well. I mean, you know, we do already have um, users in something like 110 countries. Um, so that happens like with the, you know, that happens naturally with an online brand. Um, but it does also show us that it's, um, Sugar is something that's universally um, appealing. 
and that there is, a, I guess, a, a demand for it um, in all kinds of cultures and stuff. But there is a challenge when, when you talk about something like becoming a household brand um, from something that started as a very meaningful online brand um, with, a, with an online brand, the re media is so rich and like I've talked about the community um, aspect, you can build something that is incredibly meaningful and you're talking, you have video, you have blogs, you can, um, you can really articulate an opinion and get, you know, motivate people around something, whereas I think, you know, when you get to a more mature brand that say sits on a shelf in a store, um, it's a lot more limited what sort of, you know, uh, meaning you can get from that, normally those purchases um, will be practical purchases, they'll be based on a need where my hiking boot is um, leaking so I need to solve it. Um, but I guess from our point of view that's fine, we definitely want to like be the pragmatic brand but we also want to find ways to um, continue to create um, interesting um, stuff that is about um, living a life that is more about having an attitude to your stuff that is like I'm going to keep my stuff, I'm going to maintain it, I'm going to look after it um, and I'm going to modify it if I need to as my needs change. Like It is important to us that we continue to um, develop those stories and I guess we are still very excited about um, how um, the online opportunities might grow and also where um, TV and um, internet is starting to cross. I think there's big opportunities there to build sort of rich stories around, around what we're doing. And yeah, very excited about the future.